Hey everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. Today's video was actually supposed to be a walk around the garden a chat update video, but the day got away from me and it's now like five o'clock in the afternoon and everything looks super sad <laughs> because of it's been a 38 degree day and uh, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the voiceover for this food prep video and I'm going to, uh, my mic is casting weird shadows on me, let me turn a little bit, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to do this final food prep video for this month. The voiceover and stuff for that now and then I will come out and do the garden in the morning and then I've got a what we eat in a week that is mostly typed up that I will do tomorrow to go out one of the days after as well uh, but that will give me a chance to come out in the morning water everything and make everything look a little bit nicer for filming because this time of the afternoon on a 38 degree day everything just looks really really sad everything's really droopy and yeah so we'll wait till tomorrow for that one so if you're new here uh, we are a family of eight, as I said, and we live off-grid in Australia. I travel around about three and a half to four hours to do my groceries every four to six weeks, mostly six weekly, but in the lead up to Christmas, we've ended up with a couple of four-week gaps just due to timing. Uh, and when I started doing YouTube and started sharing this sort of thing, then people were always uh, asking questions about how I made the food work, how I made it last. You'll have to excuse the cockatoo that's very loudly proclaiming his tree uh, so everyone was curious as to how we made it work how we made the food last six weeks and things like that so what I do is I do food prep meal prep planning that sort of videos uh, every couple of days post each six week grocery haul that shows how I've used some of the bulk stuff that I've bought to make it last for the six weeks uh, there's always questions about fresh fruit and veg and things like that of course we don't have a huge range of fresh fruit and veg by the end of the six weeks but there are some things that last cabbages potatoes carrots if we store them correctly will last the full six weeks the potatoes are hard at this time of year but during winter they do uh, and things like that and we process things in such a way that we're still eating them and I buy lots of frozen veggies so for, as we know frozen veggies are as good for you as fresh ones just not quite as tasty but they're snap frozen and then if you steam them then you're still getting all the same nutrients anyway so they're our backup choice towards the end of the six week period uh, and we always have 10 kilos of them I suppose it's like what I aim to top up for so that that's 10 meals worth of them if we need them for whatever purpose uh, in the freezer to use uh, so this is the final <laughs> final food prep video for the October grocery haul uh, I, there's only been I think this is part four there's only been four of them this month because it's been a really strange month we had the uh, fires that got us blocked off and then we had the lightning strike on the property as well uh, it's the change of season so it's gone from being fairly fairly okay during the day like low 30s up to 38 40 degrees during the day which is always a hard thing to juggle and the nighttime temperatures have climbed too which has impacted my ability to do so sourdough and things like that I have to get my timing right again for that uh, so I've only ended up doing this is the fourth prep video because we just we just uh haven't done the kind of things that I have felt were worth sharing I suppose uh, and this one's a little bit all over the place uh, and then because it's only a four week period too it just feels like the like six weeks just jumps up at me and four weeks has been like really short <laughs> so uh sorry there's something slithering over there and i'm just making sure it's a lizard not a snake because we're in amongst a whole lot of uh, uh garden stuff uh so this is the last video for october as i said i have repeated myself it's late in the afternoon and i've been at this all day and i'm tired <laughs> so enjoy watching so i got a couple of boxes of tomatoes really cheap and i also got some tomatoes with the monthly food hamper so i wanted to work through those we had run out of salsa on the shelves and that's one of the things that i always make with fresh tomatoes you can make roasted salsa if that's what you want like roast the tomatoes and make salsa out of that but what we like about salsa is the fact that you're opening a jar that tastes fresh it tastes like you've just cut it up not quite like you've just cut it up but close enough that you've just cut it all up and put it on a plate rather than having been processed in a can up before it went on the plate uh, so uh, we really enjoy 
that's salsa with fresh tomatoes. Uh, the other things we tend to do with fresh tomatoes are things like pizza sauce. Um, I don't do a whole lot of pasta sauces or anything because I tend to use tin tomatoes for that because we make it in such large quantities. So I buy those big two and a half kilo tins of diced tomatoes from Costco and we use that as the base for pasta sauce. Uh, but uh, the pizza sauce and the uh, salsa are our favorite things to do with fresh tomatoes so that's what I tend to lean towards unless I have a huge surplus and that's different but when we've got to make a choice that's the choices we make so all I do is I cut the tomatoes in half and cut the core out I don't peel them I don't deseed them I don't do anything else I just cut them in half and take the cores out and then use them as is seeds and all uh, seeds and skins and all uh, so I use the thermomix to turbo the tomato into pieces and measure approximate quantities in the pot so I've taken the cores out and then I just fill the thermomix jug with the the quarters of the tomato and then I turbo it a couple of times like you do in any sort of a food processor the thermomix has a turbo as well it has a one second turbo and a two second turbo Turbo. may even have a half a second turbo come to think of it uh, so I want to turbo them so that we end up with little diced pieces you don't want them too uniform because salsa is nice when you don't have it too uniform but it's broken up a little bit and you want to do it with something with blades because you want that skin cut into pieces as well now because you're not cooking the salsa extensively you're not going to end up with those cooked pieces of skin that roll up and are quite unpleasant it would still be just stuck to the tomato because it's not being heated excessively which is why you want to do it that way so i use the thermix to turbo it and then i just measure it approximate quantities in the pot as i'm going so i know that the thermix jug is around about five cups of diced tomato once it's done or seven cups i can't remember off the top of my head but i do the first one i measure it into a measuring jug seven i think it is measure it into a measuring jug measure it into the pot and then do a couple more to make sure that i'm getting consistent amounts and that's the approximate cup measurement of diced tomatoes that i'm working with for the recipe i also do onions garlic and chilies in the thermix as well we like our onion to be fairly nice and small i did end up accidentally pureeing it a little bit in this one normally i wouldn't quite do that but we do like it cut up fairly nice and small uh, the chilies i used were just from the freezer we didn't have like it's the wrong time of year for me to have fresh from the garden and i didn't have much of anything from hampers or anything that i had available so i found a small bag in the freezer that had some of the argy pineapple in it as well as some jalapenos from the garden uh, the year before last i think it was and i cut them up and put them in now i left all the seeds and everything in them because i only had a handful of them it's going to end up being quite a mild salsa but you know it's nice to have a mild one every now and again as well Add it all to the pot. I had some frozen lime juice cubes. So this is lime juice that we juiced from limes and then frozen into cubes. Uh, apple cider vinegar, salt and stir it up. Uh, and then you wanna bring it to a boil, but then turn it down to a simmer for 15 minutes to let those flavors melt. So you wanna make sure that it gets up to a simmer for long enough that all the flavors permeate the whole the whole lot but at the same time you don't want to cook it too much because the as i said the point of the salsa is that it tastes like fresh tomatoes out of a jar which is what we really enjoy uh, i used a range of jars with this one i don't normally can salsa in 250 ml jars but we did consider it might be nice for like a single serve of putting in a bowl and dipping some chips but mostly i'm just really short on jars at the moment uh, and some lids like i had a limited choice of jars that i had lids for and vice versa so we just were using what we had i do need to do a bulk order for some more lids and some more jars and i will do that shortly but i do have a whole bunch of 27s in the fowlers but they're a little too big they're 850 mils and the problem is is that when we open a jar of salsa and the rest of it goes in the fridge it quite often gets forgotten that it's there because we tend to use an entire bag of corn chips or two bags of corn chips when we sit and eat salsa and then there's you're not opening another bag of corn chips but you've got the salsa sitting there kind of thing so anyway uh we they're a little too large and i don't have many of the 20s which are sort of a 600 mil they're a bit like a, a, a pint size uh so i'm gonna mix the supermarket jars here and the 250 mils these all use 63 millimeter lids which will, makes it nice and easy some of the lids i'm using are new and some i'm reusing depending on the condition of the lids and stuff i make that call as i'm washing the jars and the lids in preparation for filling as to whether the lid looks nice and pristine or whether it looks like it's got some damage and things like that uh, some go into a basket that are used for storage only some go in the bin it just really depends on the the, the state of the lid when i have a good look at it 
I wash all the jars in warm water with very with a tiny bit of soap and rinse them also in warm water because the salsa is warm so we want the jars to be as well. You don't need to sterilize your jars so long as you're processing them for over 10 minutes as this does that job for you. It's in new guidelines you used to have to sterilize your jars before you filled them but now so long as whatever you're processing is being processed for over 10 minutes then you don't have to pre-sterilize your jars which is very handy for me because sterilizing jars would be awfully hard in my situation uh, though we are considering a dishwasher which will make washing jars a lot easier but we're still debating the cost and the power usage and stuff and whether it's feasible for us or not so uh, but in the meantime it's awfully hard to sterilize jars with, my, with our supplies available filled all the jars we use a slotted spoon so that you're getting mostly solids out of the salsa you don't want to strain the salsa because you don't want it to be dry but you also don't want excessive amounts of that tomato water in there either and the only way to reduce that liquid is to cook it down which we also don't want to do because then it would be like a cooked tomato sauce instead of being a salsa so we want limited cooking time which means that there's going to be a lot of excess water in the pot uh, we're going to steam can these so i want enough jars to fill the steam can up but we'll probably have to do more than one load for the quantity uh, I filled the jars, I debubbled the jars, which is a step that I realized I forget to show quite a bit. I use a chopstick, shift all the solids around so that everything settles and then top up the jars as needed because it will impact the headspace by doing that. Any air pockets in the jars will get filled with solids and then you'll have more headspace in the top to fill with product. Uh, clean all the rims with white vinegar. I like to give the inside of the lids a wipe out as well Especially if they're being reused just to make sure that there's no dust or grease on the inside of them to interfere with the seal uh, I didn't um, Can the tomato water this time. I have done it in the past thinking that that slightly onion peppery sort of water could be used to cook rice and stuff in but to be honest I just forget it's there and it's not getting used so it's just somewhat pointless for me to do it uh, uses jars for something that I'm not actually going to t pull off the shelf to use so we haven't been canning that tomato water we've just been discarding it I did a bit of a Jenga fill into the seam canner I've rotated stuff around to get what I could get in there the seam can has already been on for a couple of minutes so that the water in the bottom is warm as well so we're putting warm product in warm jars and into a warm canner this should alleviate any sort of temperature shock by doing that it doesn't you still occasionally get it but it does happen the lid goes on for me it has to reach the dark green part of the dial for my altitude so we slowly bring it up to that on the gas burner you can bring the steam, steam canner up too fast and if the temp is too high the lid kind of like jiggles and you're releasing steam around the edge of the lid instead of just through the little hole that it's supposed to be through so you definitely have to watch the temperature that you're running it at and drop it down a bit uh, it's quite a thin aluminium base as well, which is why it's lovely and quick to heat up and to process stuff, but something to be aware of when using it on a gas hob because it can warp if you have too high heat on it. So it's something that doesn't have full heat when you're using the steam canner uh, because it's got that thinner base. I process these for 15 minutes. After the first load is processed and came down in temp a little bit, I removed them. I could not for the life of me find my jar lifters so I used this little silicon thing it was a bit awkward but uh, it worked for me to get the jars out could use a tea towel or anything like that this was just at hand that I used but my jar lifter is a whole lot easier then I put the second load into the canner I added a little bit of cool water into the base of the canner just to bring that temperature off boiling because the jars are warm not boiling and then added the second lot of jars uh, and then processed them for 15 minutes as well uh, then after that all the jars come out of the canner they sit on the bench for 24 hours before the seals get checked and they get added to the shelves we have cracked them open they are definitely much milder than normal uh, but they're still super tasty and they still have that lovely fresh tomato flavor and texture which is why we love the the salsa that you know to have that on the shelf for those sorts of things so I'm looking forward to making more from our own tomatoes and chilies eventually this year though that'll be nice to have the different varieties of chilies to choose the heat level and stuff that we want to and the different varieties of tomatoes 
One of the other things that I had to process this month was something that I hadn't purchased. We aren't getting or didn't get a food hamper this month because Peter and Lois organised for hampers to come out for people who were affected by the bushfires. There was quite a few people who lost power for four or five days, not something I'd really thought about because we have solar so we don't tend to lose power uh, unless it's our own fault. But they lost power for four to five days and lost and had been evacuated so they couldn't even do anything with the stuff that was there went home to find it all gone uh, so she organized Lois and Peter organized some hampers for the people who were affected by the bushfires out here I don't believe that many people lost actual properties I think there was only five maybe uh, but a lot of people were evacuated and put out over that time and so they were grateful for that uh, she called me up because she had a 15 kilo box of frozen chicken that she couldn't split up to give to people because it was frozen solid so she had no way of splitting it up for people uh, and and she wasn't she didn't want to do anything with it and she wasn't real sure what it was either so she asked me if I would use it because she thought that I could make good use of it and I said I'm happy to because I'm happy to put the work in for the food when I got it I wasn't really sure what kind of chicken it was <laughs> it just said 15 kilos of scrap chicken on the side of the box I kind of thought it might have been chicken pieces or something like you know just whole pieces bone in pieces that a lot of people don't like to use uh, but I put the box in the fridge to defrost enough that I could work it out and figure it out uh, just needed to get it softened enough that I could break pieces off it so so that I could figure out what it was after a couple of days the outside edges were mostly defrosted and the middle was at a point where I could probably pull the bulk of it apart or use a knife or whatever I needed to do to get it sort of apart enough to do something with. Uh, this is when I realized that it was literally scrap chicken. So I'd say it's all the off cuts like when they're cutting up things to sell, bits of ends of tenderloins, ends of thighs and breasts, cleaning up chicken pieces that they're selling as chicken pieces. Still perfectly usable meat but a bit more challenging the text the sizes was very variable there were some tiny pieces some slightly larger pieces there was a lot of bit of those uh tendon pieces off the end of tenderloins and things like that so what i decided to do was mince the whole 15 kilos that way all the good meaty bits would be mixed in with the slightly less desirable tendon parts i didn't think cooking it up as was would really be pleasant texture wise depending on what you put it in I suppose I suppose I could have slow cooked it in a soup or something maybe uh, but I thought the easiest way to do it was just to mince the whole lot and then I could pick you know pick and choose what I wanted to do with the chicken mince afterwards so I pulled the grinder out I have the Louvelle grinder I'm very happy with this grinder there is an affiliate code that I will put in the description if anyone's interested but it is it has been a real workhorse for me and I have found it to be wonderful I did have some troubleshooting to do because I don't generally mince chicken so when I started putting it through it was kind of mushing it up rather than mincing it and it was getting caught around the blades the all the little tendony bits were getting stuck so I ended up experimenting and going with a much larger hold mincing plate than I use for beef mince something that had much bigger holes on it once I got this on it worked really well and the chicken being so tender the bigger piece is really not an issue uh, mince you want it to be a bit smaller because it's kind of a tough meat so you want the smaller pieces for that for the texture but for chicken it's a it's a very uh, tender meat anyway so it doesn't really make that much of a difference uh, the middle of the thing was still frozen which is beneficial when you're mincing if you mince not solid frozen but if you mince partially frozen meat then it goes through the grinder in a neater way too so that was helpful for that I minced a big bowl full and then put that in bags for the freezer now the rules around refreezing meats are of course to your comfort level your kitchen your rules of course your kitchen your rules but the guidelines did change a while back because that like I remember as a child that you would never refreeze uh, raw meat uh, but the guidelines did change and so long as the meat has been defrosted in a fridge so at five degrees or under then it's fine to refreeze it uh, the this was defrosted in the freezer in the fridge sorry and there was a lot of ice crystals still through it as well so that means that it was still at a fairly low temperature which makes me comfortable to refreeze it uh, so what i did initially was just minced up a whole bunch of it and packed it into ziploc bags to put in the freezer so i did these ziploc bags in about two kilo portions and i did five of them i think about 10 kilos of the mints went into the bags and back into the freezer to use later on in the month or oh, well next month now uh, so they i have a whole bunch of things i can do with them i can use them for uh, spring rolls maybe some gyoza i could even do chicken sausage rolls or we can just cook it up as chicken mints and eat it as chicken mince instead of beef mince so there's plenty of things that it can be used for that we will use it for so I minced bagged and put them in the freezer first so that they were at the lower 
at the high attempts for the absolutely shortest time possible. That's the stuff that I was putting straight back in the freezer, so it makes sense to do that straight up. I continued on and minced the rest of the box. One of the things I decided to make before putting back in the freezer is Kiev's. So I may, I have made these before. Uh, I don't make them that often because I don't buy chicken mince and I tend to use the chicken we do buy as is rather than mincing it. So this was a good opportunity to make some because I had the chicken mince to use. I had some roasted garlic and herb butter already frozen in portions from last time I'd made the Kiev's and had extra. So I grabbed the bag of those pre-frozen chunks out. I measured out two portions of about 60 grams each of the chicken mince. I flattened the first portion out, put the chunk of garlic butter in it, and then molded the second portion over the top, firmly pushing it all together and then rolling it in crumbs. Now, the crumbs are a bit of a combo. These were just a bit of a pick and mix. There's some bagel crumbs in there with the seeds and the everything bagel seasoning. There was some seasoned flour that I had left over from when I've crumbed KFC chicken before, uh, and that gives you the smaller grains that will help stick to the chicken a bit better as well with the bigger grains as well uh, I think there's even some of the lard crumbles in there so when we render lard you end up with these brown crunchy bits of fat that don't that once they're cooked out that you have and I freeze it and then I grind it up to put into breadcrumbs at a later date or various other things so I believe that there were some of those in there as well as long as some seasoning as long with some seasoning as well and I put a couple of spoonfuls of the grana padano cheese that I've been buying which I found the kids and Daryl can tolerate in things like this where it adds these massive amounts of flavor but very minimal dairy being such a hard cheese and it's you're only using like a spoonful or two into the crumbs or into a cheese sauce or something and it just adds such a huge boost of flavor without being too much of an issue I made about 19 of these that was how many portions of the garlic butter that I had left and I didn't feel like making any more of the garlic butter uh, then put them in the freezer on the tray to flash freeze before they can go in containers or bags and that way they won't stick together when they go into those containers. Now this is going to give them a bit of a flat bottom, freezing them on trays, and these will have a tendency to weep when you cook them. Uh, when they go, we put them from frozen into the oven and they will generally crack and weep the garlic butter. But if you do it in a tray where they're cooking in their own garlic butter, it tastes quite nice like that too. We have decided that we might try frying some of these too because theoretically frying them will hold the garlic butter in the middle, but uh, We'll see how we go with those. I did cook a batch in the What We Eat In A Week, so you'll see some cooked in the What We Eat In A Week video, which will be like two videos away. Uh, the rest of the chicken mince I had left, I cooked off in batches in the cast iron. All I did was put it in the pan, sprinkle some salt, pepper, smoked paprika, garlic, onion, and stuff over it. I was gonna make up a batch of taco seasoning, but I couldn't find my cumin anywhere. So I decided to just go with all the old standards. I was pretty over it by that point. All I did was break it up and cook it off and then pull it out. Add another batch, do the same thing. This again was utilized in a variety of ways. There was nachos, there was breakfast burrito style wraps. Again, the what we eat in a week in a couple of days will have those meals that I used this for. And that was sort of it for this month's prep. So as I said, the month was a little bit odd because it was shorter, it's only a four week period. We had the fires and there's just been, a, the change of season has really impacted uh, timing for breads and things like that. So there's been a bit of a change this month in eating habits and it will change again over the next couple of months, I reckon too, because we do Christmas and stuff too. And there's always added things like this month I'll buy ham, so we buy the legs of ham on the bone and I buy them, they're, they're out at Costco because I saw in the Facebook group that they've got them at the moment. So I'll buy a big one this shopping trip and I'll buy a big one next shopping trip. And we yet tend to use those a lot for lunches. We just slice ham off and have it with whatever we're having. Uh, so that changes the some of the dynamics of food a little bit there too. Uh, and I'm also assessing what we might need uh, for it, Christmas itself we always do some fancier food at Christmas we always buy a box of frozen prawns and things like that so the food in summer is very different to our food in winter and I think doing the videos has sort of hit that home a little more than I realized because I'm actually assessing it as I go because I can actually see the differences between the videos that I filmed a couple of months ago versus now and how the food prep goes but the four weeks has come so quickly. <laughs> I'm really glad we do six weeks because this four week span has just crept up really fast. Uh, and 
I know we used to do it every four weeks and then when it got to the six weeks it felt like the six weeks took forever but I think as we've gotten better at the way we do food we have heaps of food left uh, not much in the way of fruit and veg of course but heaps of other food and we could definitely go much longer but going eight weeks would have been a stretch which is why we did the four weeks so thanks for joining me again today and I will see you on the next video bye guys